Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, uh, Shallon and Bryce and Gwen uh, for leading us in worship here today. Uh, I was telling Rob just a moment ago before we came out to begin worship service this morning, uh, I was asking him about the sermon. I said, did you have a chance to see the sermon, what was going to be preached today and planning and preparing the music? And uh, he said he had not had the opportunity to do that. We had not been able to talk about that this week. And uh, it just shows you that we don't have to talk for God to know exactly what we hear. One of my favorite points of the message today is the fourth point, And I'm going to just go there real quick, but we'll come back there again. It talks about the awesomeness of God. And then we sing about it here. So God, uh, he was in on the planning and and providing, and we are able to hear that through the song service, getting us ready to worship the Lord here this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good Good to see each of you today with your big smiles on and your happy faces, and I pray that you have those on you today, Uh, being able to just kind of look around and see each of you here. Uh, This has been a difficult week in a lot of ways for many of our people Uh, Some of our family here at West Acres, I I look and I see uh, Mr. Vernon and Lynette Blanchard, and also I don't see Papa here today, Uh, but um, as you all know, with uh, the fire that took place the first part of the week in the Marshall Retirement uh, community, the home there, um, but we're able to have uh, especially the Blanchards here. And can I just tell you something that uh, Mr. Vernon celebrated 90 years yesterday. His birthday was yesterday, 90 years. And what a, what a great attitude for a man to have. He was showing me his new clothes that he has on because that's <laughs> got some brand new clothes. And uh, we're, that is a sad thing that what took place, but we're so thankful that that they're sitting where they are, and uh, we can worship with them and pray that we have many more days to worship with them together as we thank the Lord for safety he brought to them. Is Papa here? Okay, is the, the page, is it the, the pages? Okay, that's, I wasn't for sure exactly where you folks live, so we have another family that's here as well from, that, uh, th- from the same community or the home there. And uh, we're thankful to have you all here today as well because it could have turned out a lot worse as we m- much know. And I'm just thankful that the Lord has allowed us to come in his house to worship the Lord here today. So uh, again, you never know, do you? What a day holds, but the great thing for us as believers, we know who holds the day. And uh, so we can trust that even here this morning. So again, thank you for being here and look forward to seeing what God is going to do this morning. Yes, we're in the summer already as we come together the first Sunday today here in June. It's hard to believe it's already here, but it is. And uh, many times we all go on vacation. And I'm not just talking about going to Myrtle Beach or to, the, to Florida or going to the mountains. I'm talking about sometimes when summertime comes, you come and sit in your green pew on vacation. And there's no vacation going on in here, okay? Uh, This is no vacation zone. Uh, We're here to hear the Word of God, to be challenged by Him, be moved by Him, and work for Him because there's no retirement, there's no rest time, there's just time serving the Lord, giving the Lord praise, honor, and glory. Students, thank you for being here as well, uh, here this morning. We're going to be going to the book of 1 Peter today. The book of 1 Peter, I've entitled the message, uh, A Jesus-Filled Life, A Christ-Filled Life. And we're going to be talking about some very important scriptures coming from 1 Peter chapter 1 today. And go ahead and turn there. And we're going to begin in verse 13. Verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1, and if you would, let's honor uh, the reading of God's word by standing here today as we thank him for his word, but most of all, his presence even with us today. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13, and you just follow along with me as we just listen to these words. There are some of these verses that are really, really familiar to you, and maybe some, maybe the, the not as familiar, but I know verse 15 is one that'll jump out to you when we get there. Verse 13 says these words, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. 
But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Did I hear an amen there? I thought I heard that in verse 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for speaking to us already by the reading of your word. I pray, Father, that you will help each of us in this room to be ready to go where you lead us, to be found faithful as we obediently follow your direction for our lives even here today. I thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate life in this room today because you are the life giver. I thank you, Father, that we, many of us in this room, represent you and represent your life because you're alive and well and living in us right now. And we celebrate that this morning. And I pray that you'll help us never, ever to get over the fact that you are within us as believers. And what that means today may have become a little weary, maybe a little shaky. Maybe we've forgotten what it means to know that the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, lives in the heart and the lives of all all believers in this room, I pray that you will open our eyes and see what that means and see how our life is to be lived and to see what we're to look at, what, how we're to talk, where we're to go and what we're to do. I pray, Father, that you would inspire me to stand behind your cross here this morning and I would stand and open my mouth and I would decrease, you would increase and we would leave here knowing that we've been in the presence of majesty and glory and the presence of the Holy One, the one that is true, without blemish, without sin that we're able to stand before you as you even live within us to worship your name and I pray that we will do that in all that is within us this morning and we'll leave here worshiping you this morning thank you for what you're going to do thank you for your words now help us to get started the way you want us to father as we as we just begin to build the message that you have given to us or talk about the message that you provided for us. And Lord, please help us to be attentive this morning. Help us to be on the edge of our seats waiting to see what you're going to say to us next. Thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated this morning. And as you're being seated today, I believe, please, I just want to ask you, as I prayed and asked the Lord for it, I want to ask you to be very open to allow the Lord this morning to keep your focus on him and his word. Uh, the message is going to begin with some scripture. We've already read scripture, but the message is going to continue taking us through the scripture of the word of God to prepare us for the rest of this message. So many times at the beginning of a message, we kind of get warmed up and we kind of get situated in our seat and make sure we got our pen, that it's working right and, and that we're, we're all ready to go. And whenever you're ready to go, you've missed the, 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 the first part that's so important in setting the stage of where we're going. So this morning, I want you to be really focused as we talk about this Jesus-filled life, this life that he has given to each and every believer and, and as I think about this, there was something that came to mind through the study of the scripture this past week was just the concept, this wonderful concept that's in the Bible that the Apostle Paul has even given us. We're talking about Peter here, I know, this morning, but as we even think about the Apostle Paul in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, one of my favorite verses of scripture and perhaps one of yours as well, but in Colossians 1, verse 27, it says these words, 
to them God willed, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the majesty or mystery among the Gentiles. And this is the part I want you to hear, which is Christ in you, which is Christ in you, the hope of all glory. With Christ, the Son of God that is within you. In other words, Jesus Christ is living within you. Jesus Christ, if you're a believer here today, Jesus Christ is living within you. He's living within us as believers today. And also there's another very important passage of Scripture that you have on your heart this morning perhaps or will in just a moment. And it's Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but here it comes. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So he, in two passages of scripture here in Colossians and also in Galatians, we're able to see here that he reminds us that Christ, the Son of God, the creator, the one who went to the cross, the one who shed his blood, the one who died and freely gave it all to us, but calls him his life, is the one as a believer here this morning lives in you. And if you're here today without Christ, that you came with a great, a great time to be in the house of the Lord this morning because we're going to talk about if you're here today and you don't know Christ and you don't have him as your personal Lord and Savior, that he's not living in you, you can leave here today, here in just a moment, and you can say, now those two verses, they speak to my heart because Christ is living within me. He says, Christ is living within us. Well, we can keep on going. I want to give you another verse. I'm going to give you another verse here this morning. John wrote in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. John 1, 1 John 4, 4 says this. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And here it comes. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He, so he, again, he's talking about the believer. He's talking about the challenges, the struggles, the temptations, the hard times that you face, that this world pounds and throws at us over and over and over and over again. He says, greater is he, Jesus Christ within you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world that's trying to destroy your life, discourage you and tear you apart. He's saying, greater is he that is in you, not greater is he that's going to be in you, not greater is he that used to be in you, not greater is he that wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if he was in you. He he says, greater is he that is in you. He, he's in you as a believer. The Lord Jesus Christ, and we can celebrate that. And no matter how many buildings, Mr. Blanchard and the pages and the, the postels and anybody else that's in this room that, that you lost your home, lost everything, it does, that, that is a sad thing and a hard thing, but yet greater is he that lives in you. Greater is he that lives in you that gives you the strength and the ability to carry on. So this morning as a Christian, so as a Christian, as we gather here today, we're all going to be able to say here something that we all know, but we're reminded of again this morning. Jesus lives in us. He lives in me. He lives in you. I'm so thankful for corporate worship, for corporate worship, because you know several things that are happening here this morning. One, we're being reminded of that we're not sinless. We're reminded, we're reminded that we have sin in our lives and we're also reminded that in the sin in our lives we're not alone and we're not able to overcome that in our lives but we can be overcomers of sin because of the one who as believers as the one who lives within us. See, I'm reminded of that here this morning and I perhaps would not have been reminded of that if I had not been here today. It's like the old preacher that once said these words, I am not inhibited I am inhabited. I am not inhibited, but I am inhabited. I have been inhabited by this relationship, this life of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Christian life is all about. A Christian, Christians, a Christian is not someone who has embraced religion. 
A Christian is someone whom Jesus Christ lives in, with, and through a resurrected life. Uh, see, that is a Christian that has been filled with the, with the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that motivates us and that encourages us to carry on. It's in, in, the, in other words, it's Christ in you. Christ in you. You allow the Jesus who is in you to control all of you. That's what living the Christian life is all about. Christ is in you. And if Christ is in you, you allow the Christ in you to control all of you. You allow him to lead you, to hold your hand sometimes, sometimes pick you up and carry you. You allow him to be the controller of your life. His life is going to be manifested in your lifestyle in a very visible way. And that's who he says that's the way you can depict and see and know if a person is a true believer of God or not. Is because the life of Christ will be manifested in their life where we can see where we can see the evidence of a changed life, as we even talked about last week. So today, this morning, I want to show you the marks of a Jesus-filled or Christ-filled life. I want you to see them, and I want you to take them with you this morning. I want you to take them home with you, and I want you to, to think about them, and I want you to allow them to work in your life and in, in your heart. First of all, and write this down, because this is not this first one is one that you don't want to hear about. This first one is one that you don't want to deal with and talk about today. But is but it is necessary, absolutely necessary, to live a Christ-filled life. If Jesus Christ is filling your life to the overflowing, if He's filling your life to the overflowing, your life is going to be marked by discipline. It's going to be marked by discipline. Now, like I said just a moment ago, I know that's not an enjoyable word, and that's not how you would like to start point number one in the message this morning. We don't like that word discipline. We don't like it as a young child, and we even grow up and become adults, and we still seemingly do not like the word discipline. But I want you to know this morning, perhaps you already know, but I remind you this morning, you cannot live a dynamic Christian life apart from discipline. It is absolutely impossible. Apart from discipline, it cannot happen. Many think the mature Christian life is something that just falls on us. That it just falls out of the sky. M mature Christian living just falls out of the sky. sky. It just happens. And, and then many times we start looking for shortcuts along the way. How can I find a shorter way to be, experience the more mature Christian life? Or what are, what's another route I can take maybe that's not so strenuous or so, so difficult or maybe so hard to understand that I read here in the Word of God? I want to tell you there are no shortcuts to a disciplined mature life there are no shortcuts it's absolutely impossible think about those with me here this morning that are even getting ready for the Olympics that begin years and years and years spend a lifetime getting ready for the Olympics those that are getting ready I want you to know they did not they did not find their lives being lazy lives they're not being lazy people they're not half-hearted people they're not they're not halfway doing anything but they are being, they're being disciplined. They are not undisciplined. They cannot be an Olympian and be undisciplined. They cannot be an Olympian, a medal winner, carrier, if they have lived undisciplined lives in preparation for the Olympics. They spent their lives training their bodies. They spent their lives training their appetites. They spent their lives training their minds. They spent their lives training and disciplining everything within their lives. All of this for one goal, and that is to receive a medal. All for one goal, to win a medal. I thought this was interesting as I thought about this little illustration of really looking at the Olympic lifestyle of those that, that are Olympians. Paul talked about those who disciplined themselves, and he talked about those that disciplined themselves to win a corruptible crown. 
That was the crown in Paul's day. Whenever the Olympics, as you know, even in Paul's days, they they had the Olympics. And he was saying even in that day, whenever the, the men or women, whomever, mainly the women at that day and time, would go through and perform at the Olympics and do this and do that and win races and, and accomplish this and get medals and, and get accolades in so many ways, everything that they are receiving will soon wither and fade away. He talks about that in his word, in the scripture. Paul says, he says, but I want to, I want to tell you something. They're living for a corruptible crown that's going to fade away and it's going to wither and be gone. But Paul says, I'm living my life to win an incorruptible crown. That's what motivated Paul more than anything. He was motivated by that incorruptible crown that he was going to receive that was not going to be placed on his head by Moses or Joshua or Abraham, but it was going to be placed on his head by the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm going to live my life for that he says if these people are going to discipline their bodies if they're going to discipline their minds if they're going to discipline their appetites to win something that's here today and gone tomorrow he says this to you and I here today shouldn't I not be willing to discipline my mind to discipline my spirit to discipline my body to win the crown that will be placed upon me when I face Jesus Christ face to face someday when I face him someday face to face We do all of this discipline, discipline to win the corruptible crown. But what about the incorruptible crown? What about the crown that will never fade, that will never vanish, will always be there with us? Look at what God's Word says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, beginning in our scripture. It says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully. Upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Great verse, but it's great to be able to understand what it means for us to go to the next step. You ever wonder? You ever wonder what it means to gird up the loins of your mind? Gird up the loins of your mind. I want to tell you back in the day, back in the day when men wore long flowing robes, they would, they would long flowing robes, and you would see that in Bible days. We even see that when we go to India, and we see the clothing that the men have as long robes that they have on. But back in the day of Peter, that back in the day of Paul, they had these long robes, and they always had they always had a black, a big black leather belt that they had around them. This big leather belt that was wrapped around them during that day and time. And when they needed to work hard, when they needed to accomplish something, they would reach down and they would get all of those, all of that robe that was down to the ground and they would pick it up and roll it up and they would tuck it in their belt, their leather belt. And that way, they were not showing off their legs. They were just, they could move finally. They could could maneuver. They could do work. They could accomplish things. They would tuck it in their belt. It gave them the ability to work without being restrained by that long robe. And Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now here, don't miss this. He says, gird up the loins of your mind. It's like the guy who has his coat on. And I don't have my coat on today. And, And I just tell you the reason why. Last week, when I didn't have a cold on or a tie, it felt so good up here preaching. I didn't sweat nearly as much and, and everything. Now, I'm not saying I won't get my coat back on, but, but, I, but the illustration is this. It's like the guy that has his coat on, and he pulls off his coat, and he throws it down, and he rolls his sleeves up, and he says, it's time to go to work. It's time to go to work. That's the picture that we have here before us. It's time to go to work. In other words, it's, I'm going to get busy with my mind, he says here. That's what he's talking about. I'm going to get busy with my mind with the things of God. I want to let the mind be thinking of God. I want to have my mind thinking on the things of God. I, I want my focus to be on the things of God. It takes discipline to keep your mind focused, and that's why we don't like it. That's why we run from it. That's why we want other things that we can hold on to, but it takes discipline of the mind to keep our focus on God. And that's why in the world we live in today, we got our mind on so many different things, focused here, there. We might focus a little bit on Sunday, on the Lord, but other days we're focused on the worldly things around us, a job, and our families, different things that take 
take our focus off God. And God says, you got to be disciplined. He says, Larry, you must be disciplined in your walk in relationship with me. Not just because you're a pastor. Not just because you're a pastor. But because you're a Christian. Because you've been called to keep your mind focused on me. I'm going to get busy with my mind concerning the things of God. See, it takes discipline to keep your mind focused on Christ. It takes discipline to make time to get the word of God in in your mind. It takes discipline. Some of you here today, some of us here today, all of us here today, our minds are not as disciplined as they should be on the things of God consistently and continually. And that's the thing that holds us back. That's what holds me back. That's what holds us as a church back. That's what keeps us from being a spiritually healthy, mature church. A mature church is because we're not disciplining our minds to the things of God. Discipline their minds to the things of the word of God so that when, when evil, when bad things, when sin creeps in, when my mind says I want to do this but my heart says you can, but, but I, they battle back and forth and whenever my mind wins over my heart, it's whenever my life has not been disciplined. It's when my life has not been disciplined. And church, we're in more mess. I get in more mess in my own life because of an undisciplined mind. Not because I don't have a heart that knows the Lord Jesus and believes in him and he lives in me, but my mind many times is not disciplined. It's not disciplined with the things of God. Okay, let's go to the second point. Keep that discipline factor in your mind because it makes a tremendous difference in our walk. Number two, if Jesus Christ is filling your life to overflowing, if he's filling your life to overflowing, your life is going to be marked by obedience. Not only is it going to be marked by discipline, it's marked by obedience. Can I just simply put it as simple as I know how to put it? We are simply to obey Christ in all things. We're simply just to obey him in all things. Look in 1 Peter 1, 14. It says, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. We are supposed, and I I said supposed, we are supposed to be living as Christians. We are supposed to be living as God's called us to be. We are not supposed to be living as Christians like we lived when we were non-Christians. Our lives should not look like they were as a believer. They should not look like they were when we were an unbeliever. Are you listening? They shouldn't resemble. They shouldn't seem like. They shouldn't act like. They shouldn't smell like. They should not have the same footprints. It should be different within our hearts and our lives because once we have Christ living within us, things are different. Now, as a believer, we're not to be patterning our lives after the principles. We're not to pattern our lives out after outlooks and teachings and truths that are not of God. And we we do that sometimes knowingly. And listen, we do that sometimes unknowingly because our minds have not been disciplined. We we allow those things to happen. We are not governed. We 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 are to be governed. We're to be controlled by. We're to be governed by the will of God, the way of God, the grace of God, all surrounded with the truth of God that he places and provides for each of us. You know, there's... There's something that warms the heart of a parent. Probably more than anything that I can think of that warms the heart of a parent. And it's called obedience. Now you think about that just for a moment. Listen, students, listen to me just for a moment. I know you're not just here, but you're in in different places. Do you want to shock your parents? I mean, do you want to shock your parents? If you want to shock your parents, you don't have to paint your hair a different color. 
You don't have to leave home as a, boy, I never dreamed I would ever say this. You don't have to leave home as a boy and arrive home later as a girl. <laughs> you, you don't have to do that to shock your parents. If you want to shock your parents when you go home today and they ask you to do something, just immediately with a smile on your face, no questions asked, do it. That's all you have to do. They ask you to do something, just do it. Smile on your face, just do it. Now, after you've called 911 and the EMTs come and put the paddles on your mom and dad and they're finally revived and they're somewhat starting to get over the shock of everything. See, as parents, there's nothing that warms your heart than for one of your children to do what you simply ask them to do. Listen, no bribing, no beating, and I know that's, I can't, and I shouldn't say that. In our world, we say it live today, but, but, but no beating, no threatening lives, and you just do it. You just do it. Now, keep that in mind. What about God? What about God? He's your heavenly father. Nothing warms his heart like a child that would just do what he says to do. I am telling you, my oldest son, 26, Tuesday. My middle son will be 24, July the 24th. My youngest son, June the 4th, this past week, turned 19. Out of all the things they've done to make their dad proud, there's nothing that has made their dad more proud than when they just obey. Amen. When you ask them to do something, they do it. You ask them not to do something because you know what could happen and they don't do it. Now, I, my boys haven't always obeyed. So I know the other side of that. It's one of the hardest things and deepest hurts to go through where there is disobedience, but it's one of the greatest things that I go through as a dad and as a mom whenever they obey. What about God? What about God whenever he tells us something and we just do it? You just do it. Someone says, I'm going to do what God says to do. I'm going to live my life the way I did. I'm not going to live my life the way I did before I got saved. I'm a born-again Christian. I'm going to let the Christ who lives in me live through me. That, that's what I want in my life. That's what I desire in my life. There was a Buddhist priest who knew a little bit about Christianity and an individual asked him, said, in your opinion, what, does, what is the difference between Buddhism and Christianity? Serious question. He said, what's the difference between Buddhism and Christianity? He said, well, it's this. The Buddhist knows what the truth is. The Buddhist knows what's right, but doesn't have the power to do it. The Buddhist knows what the truth is. The Buddhist knows what is right, but the Buddhist does not have the power to do it. And he said, the Christian, though, knows what's right and has the power to do it. The Christian knows what's right. And Christian, you have the power to do what's right. If you don't do what's right... As a Christian, it's not because you can't do right. It's not because you don't have the power to do right. The power lives in you. You choose not to do right. But as a Christian, we have the power in us to do right. Now, let me explain to you why you can obey. Don't, as a believer, don't sit there and tell me or sit there and think to try to convince yourself, I just can't obey. I want to tell you why the Christian can obey 100% of the time. I didn't say be perfect, but you can obey 100% of the time. And here's the reason why. There's someone who lives in you, and his name is Jesus Christ. He lives within you. We learned that at the beginning of the service. 
If Jesus is in you and you get out of the way, your life becomes an obedient lifestyle. If Jesus lives in you as a believer, you get out of the way, you become obedient. Jesus lives in you and you get out of the way. Whenever you're faced with being obedient or non-obedient or disobedient, you're going to choose to obey. When you do what God wants you to do, when you do what God wants you to do, there is a fulfillment that comes within your life. Fulfilling the plan of God. Fulfilling and obeying. Number three, disciplined life and an obedient life. And thirdly, if Jesus Christ is filling your life to overflowing your life, is going to be marked by holiness. It's going to be marked by holiness. Now, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. So many people have a false view of holiness, even in the church, even sitting in here this morning. We have a false view of holiness. Some think true holiness is those that wear dresses all the time. Those that, that, that don't show any skin whatsoever. Those that, that do not wear makeup at all. And, and I just want to tell you, someone asked me years ago, Pastor, do you believe in makeup? And ladies, I'm not sure what all of your backgrounds are here this morning in this place today, but you have come to a place that believes, hallelujah, in the use of makeup. <laughs> this, this church believes in the use of makeup. I can't believe I said that either, but, but, we, but, but we do. I mean, I love my wife, but she just, she looks good with makeup and without makeup and, and without makeup. Are there any other preachers out here? I need somebody to tag me out here just for a moment. <laughs> No, no, don't misunderstand. I've told my wife. I've told, I'm going to have to go somewhere I wasn't planning on going. I've told her before, you don't need makeup. Your beauty is within and without. <laughs> Even in the Christian church, even in the church here that we call home, we have off-the-wall concepts of holiness, of what holiness really is. Sometimes we think it's the, the guy in the suit and the tie and the stern look who's always, it seems like, always against everything. How'd you like those hubcaps of the preacher's new car he's got out there, which I don't have hubcaps or a new car, but the preacher's new car, is, I'm against it. What'd you think about the singing this morning? What'd you think about that? I'm just against it. What'd you, what'd you think about the sermon today? I'm against it. What'd you think about the flowers that are before us this morning? Well, I'm against it. Do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody that, that's just against it? I want to tell you what, that's not holiness. That's not holiness. You know what it sounds like to me? It sounds like the Pharisees. It sounds like the Pharisees. They look miserable, they act miserable, but they have all the right answers to everything, but there's nothing on the inside. Holiness doesn't start on the outside. Holiness starts on the inside. And when it's on the inside, it works its way out to the outside. Look in verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all, did you see that, in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. See, a holy God who saved your soul and a holy Savior who came to live in your body in the person of the Holy Spirit who gave you the Holy Scripture has said, I am holy and I'm calling you to be holy. I'm calling you to be holy. You know the word holy? The word holy means this. The word holy in this particular passage and throughout Scripture, the word holy means to be set apart. It means to be set apart. Kind of like 
sanctification, but holiness being set apart from sin. Being set apart from sin. This is why many people stop and become Pharisees right here. Because we want to be holy in some ways, but we don't want to give up our sin. That was the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees wanted to look holy, sound holy, walk holy, but they didn't want to give up their sin. They didn't want to give up their rituals. They didn't want to give up their plans and all of those things, and they became Pharisees. True holiness is set apart from sin. It's being set apart from, for an exclusive use for God. That's what holiness is. Holiness simply means I'm setting myself apart from sin so God can use me to the fullest. That's what he's saying. That's why he says, I'm holy, and I want you to be holy so I can use you to your full extent, to the full extent that I've created you. Set apart. Let me see if I can give you just a little bit of an example or illustration where that can maybe possibly make a little more sense. Ladies, do you uh, have dishes, dishes that are set apart? Do you have dishes at home that are set apart? Maybe fine china in the china cabinet. You got some fine china in the china cabinet. They're set apart. Now, what if this coming Monday evening, the football team comes in, and they go into the dining room, they open the china cabinet doors, and they pull out the fine china. They start pulling out the fine china. Hey, here you go, here you go, get in line, get you some food, throwing the fine china around all over the place. I'm going to tell you something. You are going to get a stick as quickly as possible. You're going to get out there. You're going to be saying, those are special. Those are special. Those are set aside special china dishes. Those are special. That's for Thanksgiving. That's for Christmas. My great, great grandmother, Bertha, gave those to me. Have you lost your mind? Go get those Dixie cups and paper plates. They're right in there. You go get those. Use those. They are set apart. They're set apart. When the Bible says for you to be holy, holiness is a gift and a process. Yes to God, sanctification, holiness. Yes to God, no to sin. You're set apart. It's a process. It's a gift that God has given you. If you're holy, listen to me, and I won't go very far with this, but I still believe we miss this to church. We accept, accept so, so much more in the church and even outside the church that God never intended. But if, if you're holy, if you're holy, you'll dress in a way that represents him. I just believe that. I believe that in the world today. I believe that with our teenagers today and even our adults today. Not, this is not just a teenage the thing that I'm talking about here. I believe that we will dress in a way that represents the holiness of God. So you can't wear things that whenever a guy looks at you and the only thing they're thinking about is what they shouldn't be thinking about. See, those, we live in a world that we're bombarded with that outside these walls. And then many times we're bombarded with it inside these walls. And, and we're wondering what in the world is going on. I have been raising three boys and I was one once myself as well. And we don't need any help to mess up these minds. We, we don't need any help there. We, we need help in the sense of, of if, if we're to be holy, we're to act holy. If we're to be holy, we're to look holy. If we're to be holy, we're to dress holy. In this world today, it's yes to God and it's no to sin. See, God's people don't really want to be holy, I don't think. Now, now what do I mean by that? I, just what I said. God's people don't really want to be holy. We don't want to go to hell we don't want to go to hell, but we want to live really bad. We want to live really badly until it's time to go to heaven. And then we want to get it turned around. 
I want to tell you this morning, church, I am so thankful that I can stand before you and many of you can do the very same thing and say that I belong to God, my body belongs to God, my mind belongs to God. When people look at me, I want them to know that I belong to God. I want them to know that, not because I'm a preacher. That's why whenever I go places out somewhere, unless somebody just point blank asks me or says, boy, you look like a preacher, I don't tell them I'm a preacher. Because when I tell them I'm a preacher or a pastor, then I, well, how I live, you're supposed to do that because you're a preacher or a pastor. Absolutely wrong. I'm to live the same way you're to live. And that is a holy life, being an example for the Lord God. And I want to tell you something else. It's not just how you dress. It's not just how you dress. It's also your attitude. It's your attitude. It's your hateful, mean, bitter, gossip spirit. That cannot be holy. That's unholy in so many ways. See, holiness is a matter of the heart. Final point here this morning. Final point. If Jesus Christ is filling your life to the overflowing, your life is going to be marked by all. A-W-E. It's going to be marked by all. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here, listen, in fear. In fear. Now, this is not the kind of fear, and I can tell this story, and Molly, girls, do not, do not tell this story to your daddy and your husband. It is not the kind of fear that I'm talking about several years ago whenever we were on our bus heading to Agra, going to see the Taj Mahal away when we were on an India mission trip. And I'm sitting in the front row here to the left. Jason Evans sitting in the front row here to the right. We actually have a rat on the bus. We didn't know it at the time. But there's a rat on the bus. There are curtains hanging on each side. Jason is sitting in his chair, taking it easy, probably nodding off just a little bit. There's a curtain right here on his leg. All of a sudden, he thought it was the curtain on his leg, and it was a big old rat sitting right here on his leg. Right here. Right on his leg. I didn't see this at the time, but I'm sitting sitting over here. Jason is right here. Rat's on his leg. He reaches up to see what it was, to get the curtain off, and he reaches and grabs hold of a rat. Jason Evans jumped seven and a half feet. He jumped as high as he could jump. He landed over where I was in my lap, and I'm holding him like this. I'm thinking, what in the world has just happened? What's wrong? What's wrong? He was scared to death. Now, let me just say this to all of us on that bus. We ended up all being scared to death, too. But he was the one that got it started for each of us. And it's not the kind of fear. I'm not talking about that kind of fear here. Fear in this scripture means reverential awe. It is an awe that goes beyond I can give words to express or explain. In other words, I'm to live in reverential fear of God. Every day of my life, the Christ-filled Christian is the one who has never gotten over being saved. The Christ-filled Christian is the one that's here today and is not over being saved, not gotten over what Jesus did in their heart, in their lives. Someone that gets up every day amazed at God's plan of salvation. Look in verse 18, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your father. The word redeemed, redeemed means someone paying for the release of a slave. That's what the word means right here. It's the paying for the release of a slave. Someone steps forward and says, how much does he or she owe? How much do they owe? And they say, well, they owe this much. And he says, I will pay it in full. I'll take care of all of it. I'll pay for it in full. And look in verse 18 again, knowing that you are not redeemed with the corruptible things like silver and gold from the aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Now look, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spirit. 
spot. This was not an accident. It was not fate. It says in verse 20 that it was foreordained. Look in verse 20 and 21. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope, your faith and hope are in God in God you were a slave to the devil I was a slave to the devil I was a slave to my desires I was a slave to my passion but I want you to know there was one willing to redeem me there was one one willing to pay the dead in full he came with his precious blood he came with his precious blood and when I got saved I got free Whenever Jesus came into my life, he set me free. Church, I want you to know that this morning. I want you to know that this morning. You're here today to hear a word from the Lord. And he says, if you're a Christian, you are redeemed. And he set you free. And you'll never be the same again. How can you ever get over that? How can we as a people ever get over that? The late Paul Harvey used to tell I heard him share this story several times. Anybody of you know who Paul Harvey? <laughs> Most of you do. He told this story, and I've used it in illustrations in years past, but a great story. It's a story about a little boy whose parents had indulged him, and he was a spoiled brat. Spoiled, spoiled brat. One day he was walking down the sidewalk, and he had a paper bag in his hand, and he was holding the top of the paper bag together so whatever was in could not get out. You could hear something chirping and moving in the bag. Old man went by and saw what was going on, saw the bag, and he said, What do you have in the bag there, little boy? He said, I have some birds in my bag that I caught just a little bit ago. He said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with those birds? And he says, I'm going to pull them out one at a time here, just a little bit. I'm going to pull out some of their feathers. And then I'm going to feed them to, the, to my cat. And the man said, uh, son, uh, how much would you take for those birds? He said, well, uh, you give me $2 and, and they're yours. And the old man God started digging around in his pocket and he pulled out two dollars and he bought the bag of birds from the little boy. When he took the bag, he took that bag with love. He knew exactly what he was going to do with it before he even bought them, what he wanted to do anyway. And then whenever he gave him the two dollars and received it, he took it with love. He stepped back and he opened up the top of the bag, just opened the top of the bag up and those little birds, one by one, flew out to freedom. Whenever I heard that story years ago, and even whenever I think about it even more here today, it's as if a long time ago, God met the devil, and the devil was holding a big bag. He was holding a, a big bag, and in that bag you could hear screams of people. You could hear torment all ages, male and female. When God met the devil with that big bag, he said, Devil, what do you have in the bag? And the devil responded and said, oh, God, I have people in the bag. And God said, what are you going to do with the people that you have in the bag? And the devil said, I'm going to afflict them. I'm going to torment them. And when they're worn out with the trials of life, I'm going to take them to hell. And God said... Devil, how much do you want for that bag? The devil looked at him and he said, God, it will cost the blood of your only begotten son. God didn't have to think. God didn't have to take a few moments or a few days. He said, okay. And God took his son and placed him on a cross. He shed his blood to redeem sins from slavery, from torment, and the misery of the devil. See, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is living in you here this morning. Get excited over that. 
that Jesus Christ as a believer is living within your life today. The reason he can live in you is because he has paid your sin debt in full. Paid it in full. How can you ever get over that? How can I ever get over that? It is not fate. It is not chance that you're here today. God, I believe, has brought you here so you could hear that he has redeemed you with his precious blood of his only son, Jesus Christ. And today, all you need to do is accept the gift. You don't have to pay for anything because it's already been paid for. All you have to do is say yes to God and no to sin and allow him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Many of you in here know exactly what I'm talking about because you're experiencing that now. You haven't gotten over your salvation. You're thankful, happy, praising the Lord. Even as a reminder of it here today, but some of you here this morning, you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never surrendered yourself to him. You've never said yes to Jesus. And today, you're not here by chance or fate. You're here to leave with a life that has been changed because of the Son of Jesus Christ who desires to live within you.